This conference will now be recorded. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us for this exclusive webinar on student visa application process for the USA. This webinar will help prospective students understand the nitty gritty of the student visa process and get their complex questions answered by an officer from the US consulate. I am Juhi, Chief Student Associate at ReachIV, and I will be leading today's webinar. Today, we have Megan Madsen with us, who is a Foreign Service Officer working in the Counselor Section of US Consulate Mumbai. She holds a Master's in Public Administration and a Bachelor's in International Affairs from the George Washington University in Washington, DC. She has worked for the US Department of State's Foreign Service Institute and a US Embassy Visaka in Zambia. Megan will take you through all the detailed presentation on the US student visa process and will be happy to answer any questions post the uh, webinar or during the webinar. Well, before we get started with the webinar, I would like to share a little bit about Reach IV. We are a premium education and careers advisory and we assist students uh, to get into a top schools globally. Our expert panel of study abroad and career consultants help aspiring students get accepted into Ivy League and other top ranked schools globally. Our services include counseling and profile building, college selection, application and interview preparation, among many others. Over the past eight years, we have helped several students reach top schools of their choice globally. I will now hand over to Megan to continue further with the presentation. Great, thank you so much, Juhi, and thank you everyone for attending. It's really a pleasure to talk with all of you this evening, and I'm so excited to give this information to you. Um, a quick note is that I'm giving this presentation on March 29th, 2019. So if you're watching this recorded in the future, just make sure that you've got our most up-to-date information uh, regarding the visa process by going to travel.state.gov and ustraveldocs.com. So I hope to answer all of your questions this evening, uh, but of course we do have just one hour, so I won't be able to take all of them, uh, but I will try to do my best to select the most relevant questions for everyone. Another note is that I'm based in Mumbai, so I'll be focusing on our process here in Mumbai. If you're applying from a different country, I encourage you to look uh, more in depth online at the process there too. Great, so uh, to get things started tonight, I would like to ask uh, first if everyone can just put a message in the chat option. I would love to ask firstly, where are you guys from? Would love to know um, if you're joining from in or outside of India, outside of India and what city you're joining from. So Megan, we have students who have registered uh, who are based in India as well as abroad. Maybe mm -hmm. what you can do is, as discussed, uh, if you can share, uh, you know, if you have a survey link or something, you can share in the chat window and students can probably fill that for you and you will have the information as to, you know, which country they are from. Okay. I'll try to just uh, keep tabs on what your chat responses are broadly. And then if people also want to put in the chat um, sort of what stage of the process you're at. So I'm curious if you're in your initial stage of looking at schools or if you've already been accepted to a school, uh, sort of where in the process you're at too. That is also helpful information. Okay, so to... Uh, I'll, I'll keep track of those. Thank you for putting it in our chat. Um, and uh, we'll get things started. So, uh, in total in the US, there are over 400,000 different universities. There are a lot of different colleges and universities in the United States. And we have all sorts of international students. So, um, you might not know it, but actually, currently there are over 1 million international students studying in the United States. And of those, 
you might be wondering, well, where does India rank? How many students does India send? So I'll let you think about it for just a minute. And actually, India ranks the second largest foreign nationality studying in uh, the United States. So there are over, like the slide says, almost 200,000 students from India studying in the United States currently. So that gives you sort of context of what we're looking at today, that a lot of people are doing this process. It's very possible and um, welcoming as well to international students. So that's why we're talking today about the mechanics. How do people um, you know, make that happen? First, let's think about the timeline. What is it like to apply to U.S. University? So from your responses, it looks like a couple of people have been accepted to schools. A couple are still researching, uh, which is wonderful. You guys are doing awesome work out there. So the timeline sort of looks like this. It takes a good amount of time to apply to a U.S. university. And I know because, of course, I have also gone through this process. Um, it takes a, quite a bit. So about 18 months out, we want to look at what types of schools, what types of programs are we interested in. I see uh, one attendee, thank you so much. You're still researching your choice school. A great uh, resource for that is to look at educationusa.com. That's a really good link. Definitely check that out to research, um, as well as our college board. Uh, that's a good, if you just Google US News, college board rankings, that's also helpful to see different schools that you're interested in in different topics. So then we move to uh, sort of your test taking, if you need to take GRE examinations, uh, if you need to do pre-applications, uh, gathering those types of materials. And then this says about 10 months out, you're going to start applying to your schools. So once you narrowed down those options to what you'll actually be looking at, you'll of course start to actually work on your applications. This really gets into the meat of it. You'll be doing your essay writing, you'll be reaching out to your references. And the main thing here I would say yeah. is to check with the different schools that you're applying to, uh, be asking them any questions and making sure that you submit all of the documents on time. A good note for this too, is that you want to make sure that you are applying um, if there is an earlier financial aid deadline that you meet that application. So check because some schools have an earlier deadline to be considered for financial aid. So moving on down the process, um, if you've got different, um, you know, about six months out, you will get, you will hear back from your schools that you've applied to. At this point, they'll let you know if you've received any type of aid, um, any type of you know, uh, pending uh, information on your admission. And then the last part, which we will focus on today, is applying for your student visa. So once that's all said and done, uh, we are the last step is to come to us at the consulate to apply for your visa. So that's an overview of the process. I'm happy to talk more about any of those stages. And if you'd like more information on those, uh, just you know, either send a private or a, a message to all in the chat. And I'm happy to talk about more about those stages. I think the biggest thing to be aware of is just how long it takes. You know, if uh, you really would like to study in the US is to get, the earlier you think about all of these things, the better. And it sounds like many of you are well on your way, which is great. So now we'll shift to talking more about the student visa. So I think this slide has our biggest message that we'll talk about today. Applying for your visa is much easier than you think, as long as you have prepared properly. If you have done all of your other stages, you really thought about where you want to go, why you want to go there, how you're going to pay for school, I guarantee that this is the easiest part of the process.
the United States welcomes legitimate student travelers from all around the world. And last year, there was a 5.4% increase in Indian students studying in the US. So like I keep emphasizing, this is a very doable process. So let's get into the visa application process. The first step to getting your visa, this is all, of course, after you've received admission to your program. And so once you've received admission, you're going to start with step A. This is requesting the I-20 from your university. To do this, you're going to coordinate with that same international student office that you will have already been talking with. So this is the office that's going to be your point of contact really throughout um, the admissions process once you've been accepted. They're likely the ones that reach out to you. This is the office you're going to work with and specifically in the school, um, you are going to coordinate with what's called the DSO, your designated school official. Your designated school official will be the person to tell you uh, to help you get your I-20 form. I also want to take a moment that your DSO, that same official, is a really good resource for you, even once you're at school. So the DSO can tell you information about working in the United States, applying for a driver's license, applying for a social security number, and even questions within your student experience, transferring your school changing your major, or taking a break from school. So that's a, going to be your main point of contact while you're there at your university. So keep that one in mind. Your DSO, designated school official, is where you get that I-20. In short, that's who you're going to work with to get the official form. Some schools do have additional steps, though, to get your I-20. So you want to check that you're following your school's process. Once you get your I-20, which will be an original copy will be mailed to you, that's the copy that you want to bring to your visa interview. And on your I-20 form, you want to check that your start date is correct. So that's where you'll want to check. We've got one question here. Thank you so much for submitting your question, Yankia is um, when do, do American colleges like MIT and other RB League, Ivy League start their classes for admitted undergraduates? Um, a lot of schools in the US start on the semester program. So either they'll start in the fall around late August, early September, or in the spring. Um, it depends when you're admitted, and so you'll want to work with that designated school official. There are some colleges in the United States that have a trimester program, and their schedule is a little bit different. So you'll want to check on the website of the school that you're coordinating with and that you're interested in. Thank you for that question. So we've covered step A. If you've got any questions on I-20s, anything like that, please just put them in the group. So we'll talk a little bit about step B. Once you've got that I-20 form, you'll then need to complete the DS-16-0. So, uh, here are the links. I do want to highlight there's one change. There's no www on that SEAC website, S-E-A-C, the first website. Um, so first you'll want to create your user account at that website that's below at ustraveldocs.com. And then you'll need to complete the DS-16-0 form. Um, and that's on that top website. So you'll go through both of those steps. And at this point, you will also complete step C, which is paying the, the DS-16-0 fee, which is $160 uh, US dollars. You pay that on ustraveldocs.com. So there's the first steps of the visa application process. At this point, you are talking with your school, and um, you are completing your forms and paying your fee online for the DS-16-0. Uh, We've got another question that came in here. Mm -hmm. 
That's a really good question. Thank you so much for submitting. So we have a question that says, um, in general, it takes three months for the visa process. Uh, and there was a question if whether or not that takes the time, accounts for the time to get the I-20. Thank you so much for this question. The I-20 can take longer to get. So um, for one of our audience members, as an example that I'll highlight, um, it took six, about six months to process the I-20. Um, so there, sometimes the I-20 can take longer. It does depend on your school. Oh, okay, it took six weeks to process the I-20. Thank you for that clarification. So really, I recommend, uh, really, after you're admitted to the school, to start, to, kick, uh, to start that process of requesting the I-20 with them. Um, great point. Thank you so much. So we'll continue with our further steps on the visa application process. With step D, you want to, uh, next pro process is once you've got your fee paid, uh, you have your DS-16-0, uh, you've got your I-20, you'll next schedule your appointments. So to schedule your appointments, you go to that same website, ustraveldocs.com, and your first appointment will be um, booking for the consulate. Once you have your consulate visa date, which can take some time to schedule, so make sure you're also doing this quickly, uh, then they will work with you to schedule your appointment at the Visa Application Center, or the VAC. So you'll be scheduling your two appointments uh, at the Visa Application Center. You will go in to get your biometrics taken. So this is where you will take your fingerprints. At that appointment, please bring your passport and your DS-16-0. And that appointment has to be within 50 days of the scheduled interview date that you get with the consulate. So after you've taken your biometrics, um, and that's been within 150 days of your interview, not any greater than that, then you'll want to uh, go in for your visa interview at the embassy or consulate. Um, so again, book both of those appointments on ustraveldocs.com. After you've scheduled your appointments, the last step is to pay your service fee. So this is on uh, the FM, FMJ fee website that's listed here on the slide. Once you pull that open, you're going to click a button that says pay I-901 fee. It's a little bit different depending on what um, visa class you have. For our F1 student visas, they are $200 for the FMJ fee. And this is per a perfect question. We just got a question. Um, my wife is accompanying me as a dependent. Is the process for the F2 visa different? The process is exactly the same for the F2 visa. You'll go through all of these steps. The only difference is that the SEVIS fee is $0 for your spouse or dependent. So an F-2 visa for a spouse or dependent, so that means um, your spouse or a minor, a child that you've got, that fee is waived. So for that one, it's only the DS-16-0 fee. One last note on the step E. So your SEVIS fee is a unique number, and that stays with you, even if you adjust to OPT or you transfer schools. So that's good to know that you always have the same SEVIS number once you pay that fee. I think this is a good time to pause and ask for questions. Any questions on this visa application process before coming in for the interview? Okay, uh, so Megan, uh, I would like to ask a question on behalf of a couple of students. So Please. How many times uh, a student can actually apply for the you know, visa? Like if, if they applied once and it gets rejected, is there any gap on the number of applications? That's a, such a good question. There's no cap on the number of applications that you can submit. So okay. um, 
The short answer is no. For every application, you do need to make sure that you've paid all of your required fees. So that's the DS-16-0 fee, that you have your current I-20. You know, if you apply multiple times, basically you have to go through this process again. And uh, we really do want to make sure that, you know, if you're applying, uh, to especially consider, you know, uh, what we're going to talk about in just a minute, which is what we're looking for in the interview. So really think through, um, you know, what sort of we're, we're looking at and um, your, your preparation both for school and for paying for school. So, uh, but no, there is no cap on the number of times you can apply. Okay. We had one question come in on the chat as well. For how much is the DS-16-0 uh, fee? And that one, going back to the first parts of the process, is 160 US dollars. More questions on this part of the process. In audience, if you have any questions at this point, please feel free to put it in the chat window for the officer. If not, uh, you know, you can also, if, if you don't have any questions to ask right now, you can also post them towards the end of the session so that Megan can answer that for you. And we can always go back to this too. Great. So I'll answer any of those that come in, but otherwise we will move forward to the visa interview. So mm -hmm. once you've paid your fees, you've got all of your forms, now you're ready for the visa interview day. A little bit more on what to expect on the day of. Once you arrive at the embassy or consulate, do expect that it takes some time. So our, on average, an applicant spends about two hours or so waiting. It can really change though, so I don't want you to necessarily expect to. Uh, it can take uh, additional time as well. But know that it will take most of your morning to come apply with us. In addition, no technology is allowed into the embassy or consulate. So um, that's good for you to know before you arrive. Um, what to bring with you? You're going to want to bring your passport and your I-20 form. So the interview itself is very short. Um, and again, just like we said, it's all about the level, of the preparation that you've done to this point. So we're going to be looking at what other sort of ways you've been preparing um, and uh, other levels of uh, preparation. So we've got a couple of questions that came in. One is how long does the whole process take? It really does depend, uh, but block off that morning for yourself and um, it, it does depend on the day. It depends on how many people are applying that day. So that's a great question. I wish I had a better answer for you. But just do know that it will take you some time. And we've got another awesome question which leads into uh, more on what we look at. So the first question, the first um, area that you want to look at for um, the interview is first, are you sufficiently prepared for your education. So what does this mean? The officer is going to be looking at whether you've got a study plan, whether you've been preparing for school, what other programs you've been considering, and in short, how this school fits into your professional development. They may ask about, um, you know, why, why this school, why the, um, you know, why this fits into how you are developing professionally. So of course this is something you will be, you have, will have considered already as you've gone through your process of applying for schools. The second area to demonstrate is that you have a credible plan to pay for your education and expenses. So what could this look like? Um, the officer will not ask you to um, show bank account information, um, but they will ask you about this through their through questions. So be ready to talk about it in the interview. So things that uh, you might be able to talk about, you know, if your parents are paying for your school, 
if you've taken out any bank loans, if you've received any scholarships. So basically being able to describe your plan to pay for your education. One note on this is to, of course, always be honest in the interview. You want to, you know, give a picture of how you're really paying for school. Uh, paying for your education is a very serious commitment, and so it's something that you will already be considering. Uh, so, of course, always be honest about how you plan to do that. And the third and last question uh, or area to be able to demonstrate to the officer is that you plan to use your student visa appropriately. So what does this mean? This means that you've thought about what you're going to do in school, what you're going to do while you're on your visa, that you've got a plan for what you'd like to do after your graduation. So those are the three areas uh, that you will need to be able to demonstrate to the officer. Do we have any questions about the interview process? So I wanted to ask a question here, Megan, on behalf of the audience. So is there any dress code that they have to follow? And also if you can you know, guide us uh, towards a comprehensive checklist of the documents which needs to be presented you know, to the officer. Uh, and also if you can throw some light on uh, the proof of acceptable funds. You know, because in India, there are a lot of uh, formats in which people save their money. So what, what are the formats of, or, or the forms of the funds which are accepted and which are not accepted by the consulate? This is great, thank you. Well, first on dress code, there's no set dress code. And I think it's important for you to be comfortable because you know this does take uh, some time as we talked about. So there's no set dress code. On a checklist of documents, the only required documents are the passport and that I-20 form. So make sure that you bring those with you. There is a possibility that the officer may ask for additional documents. Um, but in that case, they will let you know what they're looking for. And um, so there's no need to worry about that in advance of the interview. And more on this, the, the uh, acceptable funds. So really what we're looking at is, you know, that you've thought through how exactly you're going to pay for your education. Um, this could look like, again, different types of loans from a bank or from private loans, um, whether or not your loan has interest on it, if you've received a scholarship from the school, if so, what you had to do to uh, receive that scholarship, um, if your parents or a family member are paying for school, uh, what they do, what their job is. So um, those are a, a general description of different types of acceptable funds. There's no one type of acceptable funds. Uh, just being able to describe how exactly you're going to pay for your education. Okay. I think that's helpful. Sure, thank you. Uh, we've got a couple more questions on the interview. So one is, do student visas get rejected despite loans or funds? and an I-20 in place? Um, that's a really good question. I think I, I would just say again, to be able to describe all three of those areas that we talk about uh, on the slide. So we're looking for all of those components to be in place. A sufficient plan for your education, that you're prepared for your degree, that you've got a plan to pay for school, and that you will use your student visa appropriately. Another really good question came in. What are things to avoid in the interview? Um, don't, don't be nervous about the interview at all. Like I keep saying, you know, at this point, and you guys are already on this chat and you're really thinking about, you know, how do I apply to school? How do I apply for a visa? You're really just there to tell your story and to tell, you know, why you're applying uh, for the visa. There's no, nothing really to avoid in the interview. Uh, just be calm, you know, be ready to answer questions and, and listen to the officer and give your responses. And then we also have a question, uh, what kind of personal questions do they ask? Really, the interview will be focused on exactly these three areas, talking about school, your study plans, how you've been preparing, and different finances. 
Do we have any more questions on the interview? Do we anything else at this point? Uh, no, nothing from my side at this point. Make it great. Everyone, keep sending in your questions. These are wonderful. Okay, so we'll keep moving. What happens if your visa is approved? So if your visa is approved, then the officer will retain your passport and it will take a couple of business days for the visa to be printed. You will receive a message on SMS and an email and the visa will be sent to the location that you select online, again, if approved usually done in about three to five business days. Important dates to remember. I think these are good things to take notes on. First time applicants should not schedule their visa interview more than 120 days before the program start date. So again, uh, you should be making sure that your start date on that I-20 form is valid within this date range. So your interview can only be within 120 days before when your program starts. If you're following that timeline that we talked about earlier, this will fall within that timeline. Uh, but make sure that you know, you're know you within the 120 days, that's about half a year. Another important date to remember is that anyone traveling for the first time on a student visa will not be admitted into the U.S. more than 130 days before the start date. Okay. So um, when you're making your travel plans, if your visa is approved, you can only go out 30 days in advance of your program start date. Okay. You know, move forward to additional uh, contact information, and then we can open it up to more questions and a couple of topics that I know um, our viewers are interested in. So on additional resources for you guys, which I'll leave uh, open, got the U.S. Travel Docs website, of course. Um, and then these are all different uh, resources that you can reach out to get more information on studying in the U.S. and our visa process. So I have a question here, you know, for this contact information which you just shared with our students. Uh, so at REACH IV, uh, you know, our students are based nationally, they, they are from across India. So do you have separate centers across the country or do students need to get their visa from Mumbai Center? That's such a good question. Thank you for asking that. So you'll want to go to the uh, consulate that is nearest to you. So in uh, India, we have an embassy in New Delhi. We have consulates in Mumbai, Chennai. Kolkata, and Hyderabad. So uh, when you go to the US Travel Docs website, they will help mm -hmm. you find the center that's nearest to you. Perfect, thank you. Mm -hmm. A couple more topics I wanna make sure we touch on are um, but there we often get questions about transferring schools and also questions on OPT and CPT. Yeah. So we'll talk more about uh, those topics too. We've also got a question on the timeline for uh, applying, so I'm gonna move us back to that slide. So a little bit of information on transferring schools. If you are interested in this, or if this is something that comes up during your study experience, you'll want to contact your international student's office. This can be done on the same SEVIS ID. You don't necessarily need a new visa. Um, if you prefer, you can elect to get one. So the requirements for when you are studying in the US are for you to have a valid student visa, a current I-20, and a service ID that matches the visa that you use to enter the US. 
what the, if you remember one thing about this, if it comes up, I would say is just to talk to that international student's office if this is something that comes up for you, okay? And they will help you out. Um, great, okay. I think this is a good time for us to dive into OPT. So OPT is optional, optional practical training. Uh, this is something that a lot of our students do. So it is a one-year option to work in the field that matches the degree that you've earned on your F visa. So it's got to match the degree that you earn. So it's got to match what uh, your major was in college. It is an opportunity to use the skills that you've earned in the US and start applying to them. All students are eligible for one year of OPT. And this means eligible. So that's an important word to highlight. And then for the STEM fields, currently there is an option for a two-year extension in a STEM field. So we do want to emphasize that when we're thinking about OPT, your primary purpose for studying in the US should be to get that degree. Um, these are current options that are available for our students that are finishing their degrees. But um, we want to make sure that you know you're you're first interested in studying, and um, so our current policy is that um, once you graduate and you finish your degree while on your F visa, you have 30 days to move your service status to OPT. So that's 30 days to find an employer and adjust your status uh, on the F visa. While you are employed, you still coordinate with that DSO in your university. So before you graduate, you tell your DSO that you're looking to get a job in the field. If you do, when you get a job, you tell your DSO and they enter that into your SEVIS status. So you work with that same individual that you reached out to on the I-20 form, that you coordinated with for school, to also help you adjust your status for the OPT. Um, so we've got a question, uh, can I also work while I have the student visa? That's, a, that's also a really good question. And that's something that you'll want to defer to your DSO on. So that's the perfect person to talk with about your options for work and what is permitted uh, at your university. So um, for some people, for some students also, their F1 expires before they finish the year-long OPT. As long as you are in legal status in the US, you can remain in the US. Your visa is your permission to enter. But um, you will want to make sure you've got a valid visa if you're re-entering. So you want to make sure you go through the steps to adjust your status. Do we have any questions related to OPT? We have another question that came in too on um, talking a little bit about the H-1B visa. So the H-1B visa application is um, a completely different visa category. To touch a little bit too on our interview waiver program, so an interview waiver is possible if you are applying for the same visa category. But if you're looking to change from the F visa to, for example, an H-1B or a different visa category, you have to start, start uh, the steps from the top and apply for that new visa category. So that would not be eligible for an interview waiver. For the H-1B, that's a petition-based visa, and you have to work with your employer uh, to have a petition filed and to apply again at the consulate for that different visa. We have another question, how many times can I apply for the H-1B while I'm on the OPT? There's no specific number, um, but it, it does, uh, you wanna always make sure when you're traveling to the US 
that you're on a, a, a current adjusted status, and if you're entering that your visa is still valid that you've got. It's a great question. We had another question, does MBA fall into STEM? It does not. So uh, double check again with your DSO, that uh, official at your university, if any specific uh, OPT questions, but uh, no, in general, our STEM is our science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. We have another question. How many years is the U.S. visa valid for? So the F visa is valid for duration of your studies. So that is for five years with the option to adjust your status for the one-year OPT or two-year extension in STEM is current policy. Another question that came in, should any pre-existing medical conditions be a concern for visa rejection? given that health insurance is borne by universities? It's a really good question. Um, it's, I think that this is more for you to consider on uh, your expenses, on that expense part of it that you've thought through. Um, but no, this should not be a concern. Um, as long as you have demonstrated ability to pay uh, for your school, for your conditions. Great question. I'm gonna move us back to that contact information slide. Juhi, any additional questions you can think of? Uh, at this point, I think you have covered most of the information that students you know, uh, might need uh, related to OPT. Um, however, if something comes in my mind, I'll definitely feel free to ask you. Perfect. Got another question that came in on the chat. Uh, once my F2, my wife is on the F2 visa, if she is admitted to a US school next year, what uh, is the process for changing from an F2 to an F1? That's a really good question. So this is um, a change uh, in the visa category. And so um, in that case, your wife would need to go through uh, the steps that we've talked through today, just as you did for your F1. So making sure to pay all the fees online, uh, get her required forms, and to come in for an interview at the embassy or consulate. Great okay. question. Um, I have a question here. So if a student is in the U.S. on a student visa and if they need to travel outside the U.S., during their study program, like for example, let's say they have to go for an exchange program to another university in another country. Is there any another process that the student needs to follow, like apart from applying for another visa for the new country, do they have to follow any other process, like to keep the US uh, embassy informed about their travel, anything like that? That's a really great question. Not the, um, so the U.S. Embassy does not need to be contacted, uh, but you will want to contact your designated school official. So do let them know that you're traveling uh, outside of the United States. And then you'll want to make sure that your visa, the printed stamp, is uh, going to be valid at the time that you come back in. Great okay. question. Thank you. Any additional questions? So um, every student who is, you know, looking at studying in, in the United States, uh, they, they also would want to explore some work opportunities while they are studying, like, you know, part-time job or internships. So, uh, you know, can they work on campus as well as off campus while they're on a student visa? And if yes, then what's the cap, you know, number of hours? How many hours per week, per fortnight are they allowed to work? That's a great question. I think um, the best guidance really, again, I can give, and I'm sorry I keep repeating it, but also maybe that's helpful so that everyone remembers it too, is to talk with that designated school official. Okay. So that really is going to be your best resource about talking about working in the United States um, or if, whether or not that's allowed at your university, 
uh, what sort of options are available to you. Uh, and they're going to know the ins and outs of what that looks like for international students, where you end up being located. Um, so thank you for that question. That is good. And it, it depends. OK. Do we have any more questions from the viewers? Anyone has any questions so far? I think we don't have any question at this point. Maybe maybe we can. Okay, so I think we've got one more coming in. I'm talking a little bit about timelines. So looking at the appointment schedule in cities like Mumbai, when should the latest start date of uh, visa interview be to get into the U.S. in the first week of August? Um, really, with all of these steps, I again encourage you to um, get them initiated as soon as possible. So once you've got that I-20 from your university, then you're ready to start booking your, you're paying your fees and booking your appointments. So really once you've been admitted to a program, you know that you'd like to go there, to kickstart these steps as early as possible is always helpful. And that can help with some of our booking appointment times as well. Um, so start, uh, once you've selected a school, you know you want to go there and you were admitted, get that I-20 process started so you can get all this out of the way. Just make sure you're within that 120-day limit before your program starts. Great question. I think also to close with a recapping, if I may, um, it's to uh, you know not be nervous. Again, this is the last part of a, a long process. And at this point, you've done lots of preparation, both to get your visa and to go to school. So be ready to talk about you know, your study plans, how you're paying for school. And um, that comes after, a, the, after you've done really the rest of this process. So I want you to be comfortable and encouraged. Um, we're really happy and excited that you are, would like to study in the United States. Any additional questions? So, um, it would be great if you can also throw some light on, you know, apart from uh, OPT, what are the other uh, visa uh, options students have in case if they want to uh, settle in the U.S. and, you know, work for a longer duration in the U.S. That's a really good question, too. I think this is also something that is um, it's helpful to talk about with that designated school official is what sort of options are available to you, what other international students do at your school. Uh, of course, the requirement, a key requirement of the F visa is that you do have intent to return, that your primary purpose is to go to study. So that really is what we're looking for. Um, and there are different non-immigrant visas that are uh, allowed um, for different types of work and travel to the U.S. Uh, to look more at our different visa categories, uh, take a look at travel.state.gov. And that's got a better picture of all of our different types of um, non-immigrant visas. Another good resource that I didn't talk about today, that I'll put in the in the chat as well. Thank you. Is um, from DHS. So this has a lot of other common questions about the study and application uh, process. Talked about today, even more in depth information on OPT, on applying for your student visa, and another great way to continue uh, to research and prepare. Uh. So, what is the next section that you're going to talk about today, Megan? That's all that I've got for you today. Okay, okay. 
Great. So, uh, on behalf of all the audience, uh, you know, what would be uh, a words of advice from you for our students? Because applying for the visa can, you know, at times be really stressful. Arranging the documents. Students are typically, if they are first time applicants, they're usually very worried uh, about the interview process. Uh, so, what would be your advice for them? That's this is such a good way, I think, to close us out today. My words of advice for you are the biggest one, I think, is that the process is long. It is complicated. Like I said, I went through it, too, to apply to school in the U.S., and I didn't go through the visa part of it. That's our, those are additional steps, but it can be completely worth it. It's a really rich opportunity to study in the U.S., and... Speaking a, a moment from personal experience, too, I traveled and went to school pretty far from where my home is in the United States. And it's challenging at times, for sure. I mean, you're um, farther away from your family. It's not easy to go home all of the time. But the benefits are huge. You uh, learn so much from your community, from the different types of atmospheres of schools in the U.S., and it will really make you grow and it will challenge you. I think it's a really great opportunity. So as you're going through this process, just keep those goals in mind. Just what are you thinking about? You know, where is this going to get you? And when you get frustrated, take a look at these resources that we've you know, got out there for you. Because you will never be the first person to have this question. And uh -huh. no questions are crazy. So you've obviously got a really great resource also in reach of IB and uh, reach out to those. But keep up uh, the stamina. Keep going through the different steps and, um, you know, that those are worth it in the end. And as far as the process goes itself, uh, just again, you know, that studying is a really big commitment. It's, uh, you know... It's no small undertaking. And so we do want to see that you've worked hard on this stage, that you've thought about how this education fits into uh, you know, your goals, that you really know how you're going to pay for school, that you've considered uh, different options, and you've been working hard on your applications. So once you've done all of that, um, the visa interview really is the easiest part. It's just telling that story. So don't be nervous, and uh, you guys are all doing really great work. Thank you, thank you. That's really encouraging. I actually have one more question for you here. Uh, that uh, you mentioned that actually there's no cap uh, on the number of applications that the student can apply for their visa. However, what's an ideal, you know, gap uh, between both two applications? So let's say if a student applies now and the visa gets rejected for some reason. Uh, what, what, what's the time period that they should wait for before they take their next appointment? Is there something like that? There's no set time period. I think mm -hmm. the biggest thing would, that it would be that it would take you time to get all of those materials ready again. And to really think about that you are demonstrating all three of these uh, portions on the slide. So focus less on the time and more on what does your application process look like? Are you prepared for school? Do you have the finances to talk about okay. uh, in your application? Great, thank you. Uh, one more question here that a lot of our students, they go for undergraduate degree and after completion of their undergraduation, uh, they want to study further and they apply for master's or MBA or you know, further degrees, higher degrees. So uh, for extension of their, you know, for further extension of their student visas, can they apply from within the U.S. or do they have to come back to their home country and do the whole process? That's a great question. So you are uh, eligible for the interview waiver program. Mm -hmm. and when you are applying for the same visa category. So in that case, you're, um, if your uh, visa was never canceled, it did not expire more than 12 months ago, and it's in the same category. You can apply via interview waiver as well. So that's okay. another option. All right, and if students want to have more information on this, 
can you please uh, you know guide the audience as to which website or the link that they should go to for more information if they are interested yep i'll type uh, type that out okay great So also I have one question here that, you know, if they are continuing with further education and let's say in, in certain cases their passport is expiring, so do they have an option of, uh, you know, renewing their passport uh, within the US maybe by visiting the Indian Embassy or something like that and if you have any information as to how long does it take for the process? So that I'm not as clear on because um, we just deal in US passports. Um, that is a good question, though, and you want to make sure that you've always got a valid passport while you're traveling. Um, that's something to look at, I think, before you come in for your interview, mm -hmm. is to check the validity on your passport. And if you need uh, to get a new passport, to do that in advance before your interview. Okay, Great. all right. So how long the passport should actually be valid, you know, before they apply? Is it like it should be at least valid for next six months, next 12 months? or for duration of your study, what, what exactly is the validity period? Um, that's another good question. I, I believe, so you, you will always want to travel with your, uh, your, your current passport and your, mm -hmm. when you're entering your valid visa. Right. I'm actually not 100% sure if that needs to be in the current passport. Um, but you've got to have both with you. Uh -huh. So I think some of that might come down to um, your preference. And so that might be where the interview waiver program comes in, is that you could opt to get that in your new passport. But I believe you just need both components, so the current passport and the uh, valid visa. Um, for okay. travel. Your passport can't expire within six months for sure, but um, I would recommend, especially in that first year of your program, you're going to have a lot of logistics to think about, and you're not going to want to have that as uh, you know something you're worried about. So I would want to make sure you've got a, a good amount of validity on your current passport. All right. So I, I know that you have shared the ideal timelines with students already as to you know, uh, they need to apply for their visa at least 120 days in advance. However, sometimes, you know, the decisions from the school don't come on time or it gets delayed for some or the other reason. Then what's your advice for last minute students? Because at that point, the situation becomes all the more, you know, stressful for them. So what would be your basic advice? That is really difficult. Um, it's hard to be, uh, you know, very upfront is that even when you know we're um, faced in these kind of situations, we still have to go through all of our steps to get our visa. So my best advice really is early planning. Um, the greater you can plan in advance before that semester where you actually want to start, the less likely you'll be to run into uh, those kind of stressful situations. Uh, but if you are in your, that kind of situation, if you're perhaps, you know, joining your semester late, anything like that, that uh, that is part of the role of that designated school official is to help international students. And it does happen sometimes. So if you find yourself in that situation, you still have to go through all of the steps to get your required visas and forms. Um, and that, that individual may be able to help you once you get to your university. All right, great. Thank you. Uh, do we have any more questions from the audience? Is, does anyone want to ask any question? Uh, you know, we have an officer right here who can uh, address your queries, your questions right away. So uh, we are going to circulate uh, a recording of this webinar through various channels and platforms, uh, you know, of Reach IV. So, uh, feel free to pass it on to your friends. You can always go back and view this video again to sort of have better understanding and be better prepared for your uh, visa application for the United States. Uh, I would like to take this opportunity to thank Megan for 
you know, taking out time to uh, do this webinar with us. Uh, all the information that you shared was really very helpful and uh, I'm sure it will help the students who are viewing this and who will be viewing the videos later on to prepare for their you know, application uh, in, a, in a very uh, smooth way. So um, thank you so much, uh, Megan, for your time. And it was really wonderful having you who, for the webinar. And uh, I look forward to connecting with you and doing this again in near future. Of course. And Juhi, I want to say thank you so much. You guys are doing really great work you know, and uh, offering these great resources to students. That's excellent at Reach IB. It's my pleasure yeah. to talk to you guys. Uh, you had really great questions. I love your energy and your enthusiasm. And the best of luck to all of you on your education and professional journeys. You're going to do great. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot, everyone, for joining us today. Uh, so we'll split here. And thanks again, Megan. Have a great evening. Thank you. Everyone do the same. Bye.